Shalom Chavim. We're going to look at the book of Esther today. And I have a feeling that after you hear this message on Esther, you may never look at this story the same as you have in the past. Uh, some interesting things that I believe the Lord has dealt with me on, on this story, things that I've never thought about before when looking at Esther. And I, I've really been feeling compelled to go back and read the story of Esther and after reading it and prayerfully just going through it over and over, um, I have just been amazed at what God has uh, unraveled here for me, for my brethren and sisters of the Jewish faith, and very importantly, those of the Christian faith. Um, you're going to see things and hear things uh, this, this day here that um, I hope will certainly be a blessing to you and may also cause you to recognize what you are called for as a uh, Christian believer. Uh, we're going to see a lot of things in this story and uh, it, it should give us a lot of appreciation for the stand that we have with Israel uh, as well as we go through this story here. Um, before I get into it though, let me just mention briefly for you uh, those of you that have been waiting, especially in foreign nations, that it's been ex uh, too expensive for you to be able to get the book Yam Suf, it is now available in ebook. Uh, you can get that on our website at israelreturns.com or um, you can go to, I believe, amazon.com carries it as well. It's very inexpensive. It's only $4.99 if I'm, uh, I believe that's right on that. And, uh, and secondly, uh, we are still planning to go to Israel here this uh, coming September and I, I quite frankly I don't know how that's going to happen I just believe in my heart this is it's getting close to that time and I can't say for sure that this is the year that the Lord has in mind for us but I'm just kind of prayerfully seeking his his guidance on that and in uh, and, and the way in which he will make for that as well um, uh, I want to thank you also for those of you that have that have been so kind to contribute to the ministry. Uh, it's it is you know we would love to have it to where I could spend all my time here uh, with you and talking to you about these things. Oh, and one other one other thing uh, I'd love to mention to you: there is an Israeli sister that's been watching the videos here. I won't call her name, but uh, she is is born born in Israel, lived there most of her life, lives in the United States now, uh, who will be helping us with the translation of Yam Suf. Now, when I say the translation of Yam Suf, we are looking at possibly taking the last chapter and um, uh, maybe making a book in that in itself, uh, something to be a little bit shorter, but adding to some of the depth that God has revealed to me since then for the redemption of Israel. And I think that we may entitle that book, What Would Moses Say? Uh, I say that not that I'm Moses by no means, I'm just your brother. Uh, but my point in saying it that way is to kind of get my people to understand if Moses was here himself, what would he say concerning the prophetic events that are happening in the world today? And so I want to take it from Torah, uh, take it from an approach from the Torah for, for the Jewish people to look at the fulfillment of prophecies in the day that we're living in. And we're fixing to see a lot more of that here in just a few minutes here. So let's get right into this message here. In the book of Esther, uh, I'll be using a Christian Bible for the sake of English. Uh, I don't know what I did with, uh, I had a Tanakh and I was traveling and I, I don't know if I left it somewhere or not. I mean, I have Torah, things like that here, but those are in Hebrew and it would be difficult for the Christian people or English speaking people to understand that. Um, and we may not get through all of Esther either in this. There's so much in here that's just beautiful. But we, we find that it says now uh, in verse chapter 1, verse 1, I came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, um, this is Ahasuerus, which reigneth from India even into Ethiopia over uh, 107 and 20 provinces, 127 provinces. He basically was like the king of the world at that time. That in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was uh, in Shushan, the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all the princes and his servants. Um, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces 
uh, being before him, when he shewed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty, many days, even in 140 and four, 40, excuse me, four score days, 140 days, in other words, when these were to be the expired. Now, so we just kind of we get a little picture here, get started up here. They're having a, 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 a celebration of his uh, of, of you know what he's doing here. Now, what I find interesting. Even the rabbis comment that the divine name of God is not mentioned here in the story of Esther. And I think there's a reason behind that as well. Uh, bear with me when I say this. I believe that the king here is in, 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 a, uh, in a type, we would say, is typing God himself uh, in this story. And you're going to see why as we go along here, uh, because we find, like, for example, Vashti, who is married to uh, the king at the time, she's the queen, she's married to him, and I believe that Vashti is a type of Israel. Now, this is going to help especially some of those that have the idea that, uh, that uh, Yeshua is the bride or the bridegroom of the Christian and and Yehovah uh, 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 is the, or, or Hashem is the bridegroom to the Jews. It's not the case. It's one bridegroom, and that bridegroom is God Himself, but we find that He can manifest Himself, make Himself known to His people in different, different ways. Um, uh, you know, which is kind of interesting, I believe it's Isaiah 63. And I don't want to get into this teaching so much on this, but uh, um, just to kind of give you a little clue on that, and it's always a little confusing when I'm using a Christian Bible. I've got, you know, with a Tanakh, I know exactly where to go, but the layout is a little different in the Christian Bible here. Um, and that is actually in yeah, Isaiah 63, 19. I just want to show you something here. Uh, because, and, and we are actually going to touch a little bit more on the subject of the identity of God through the story of Esther because it brings it out so beautifully. Um, Isaiah chapter 63 verse 9, it says, In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Now this is actually speaking of Hashem. This is Yahweh, Yahweh. Okay, he is, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. He feels it. He understands their pains, the children of Israel. And the angel of his presence. See, that's the key right there. What was the angel of his presence? It's the pillar of fire. It's the Shekinah. It's what God took on in order to be able to make himself known to his people. It was the Shekinah glory. And then we find that um, the same when Moses met God at the burning bush. It says that the angel of the Lord. There was no man standing there in a, in a, in a you know, Moses doesn't write about anything of a, of a, of a, uh, of, of a man dressed in white or something like that, what we would think with wings on. He speaks, uh, you know, he writes about the angel, the presence of the angel of the Lord, but then it was Yahweh, Yahweh, Hashem speaks from the midst of that burning bush, the midst of the fire itself. So what is that? The angel of his presence, as Isaiah 63 says here, is the pillar of fire. It is the form in which God is making himself known to the world. That's why the Christian Bible writes about Yeshua as being that, that, that the fullness of God dwelt in him reconciling or making known the world to himself. You know, he's just hidden in different ways. It's the same way it was when Abraham, when the one that came to Abraham, there were three that came down. And some say, well, that's the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. No, that's not. That's, that's paganism. It's not like that. God's not like that. He's one God. Deuteronomy. Shema uh, Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. Um, but anyway, that's, like I said, it's a really a different teaching altogether. But we will actually touch into that here. So let's, let's start beginning into Esther here. Let's go to uh, uh, chapter 1. Let's get, start in verse 7 here. And they gave them drink and vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. And the drink was according uh, to the law. None did compel 
For so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Now, that verse itself is amazing to me because it represents revelation. Wine is a stimulant. And the older wine gets, the stronger it gets. It's a stimulation of revelation. Okay, now you're going to see things and you may differ with me. And that's all right, brother, sister, whoever you may be. But uh, just kind of bear with me on this. But everything here is only a pattern of what would happen, not only past, but future. You know, I had a question the other day about the book of Revelation in the Christian Bible. Did I believe that that was chronological order? No, I do not. You can see the past, present, and future in that book. It's very interesting, and it's not laid out in chronology either. That's what's interesting. But here we find here that this is, and the drinking was according to the law. None did compel. God don't, you know, he's not going to force himself on you. You know? For, so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. As much as you want to believe, much as you want to receive the revelation of who God really is, God will give you. There's no forcing. Then notice here, verse 9. Also Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house which belongeth to the king, Ahasuerus. See? She was reigning and ruling in Israel before the destruction of 70 A.D. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded... Uh, uh, these are written in English. As well. I'm not looking at this from the Torah, so forgive me if I don't pronounce it right with these translations. I don't even think it's transliterations. Mehuman, Bistha, Chorbana... Uh, Bigtha and Abagatha and Zethar and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Harasas the king. Now, I made myself a note. There's seven chamberlains and then there's seven princes. And uh, I find it interesting because I wonder if, for example, the seven princes or, or the, you know, is this possibly where it speaks of the seven spirits of God, or the seven golden candlesticks that are, that are mentioned in Zechariah. Uh, Revelation in the Christian Bible speaks of the seven golden candlesticks as well, and it speaks about how that they were, uh, they were anointed of God. Um, just an interesting thought. I don't, I don't really know, but I just kind of wondered about that. To, uh, so anyway, the, 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 the chamberlains, they were there, there in the presence of the king, says, To bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal, so she, to show the people and the princess her beauty, so she was, uh, for she was fair to look upon. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. When Israel who is the bride of God himself, when he came in the form of Yeshua in a human body, she was summoned to come to be his bride, to take her place with her husband. And she refused. This in itself ought to begin to make us recognize who Yeshua really was. And who he is. She refused to be. She refused to come out at the king's command. And so did Israel. Israel refused to. Now it's not to say all Israel did. Because all Israel did not refuse. There were Jews that did believe him to be Moshiach. But she represents Israel as a whole. Of that day. I say as a whole, keep in mind, at the time that Yeshua came, there were only the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin and the Levites. The house of Israel was not there, so she does not represent the house of Israel in that perspective, I would think. Uh, but anyway, so, so she refused to come out uh, to him, and the king was angry. So then the king said to his wise men, which knew the times, for so was the king's manner. Now, now that's that was another interesting passage that I read there, right there, when he said to the wise men, 
let let that soak in for you there. Boy, that's that's an interesting one there. Um, then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times. What came to to Yeshua Jesus when he was just uh, about a two year old boy? The wise men. Where did they come from? Now, this is interesting now because remember, uh, Ahasuerus here is the king of Persia and, and over Media. And where did the wise men come from? They came from the east. Mm. Kind of interesting to think of these things. Which knew the times, and they did. They knew when Yeshua was to be born and when he was going to call Vashti, Israel, to her place. It was time for her to put on the royal apparel and to become part of to, to come and stand with her, with, her, with her lover, her God. To come with Yahweh, to be standing there as a bride adorned in her uh, royal apparel. And the wise men knew that. But Vashti did not recognize her place. So he consults with them here. He, he, and for, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. And they did. They studied under Daniel, so they knew the laws of God. And the next unto him was uh, Kershina, Shetha, uh, Adamatha, um, Mimikon, and the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face and which set the first in the kingdom. So, let's see here. We have Karshanatha, Shethar, Adamatha, Tarshish, Marizia, and, and Mersina, and Mimikin. Okay, these, these are your seven princes of, of Persia. Now, this is why I wonder if they don't represent those seven spirits of God. Um, can't say for sure, but it's just interesting to note that. What shall we do unto Queen Vashti? And, uh, hang on one second, my brothers, okay. <clears throat> what should we do to queen, to, do unto Queen Vashti according to the law? Because she hath not performed the commandment of the king, Ahasuerus, by the chamberlains. And Mimikin answered before the king and the, prince, uh, and the princess, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of uh, of the of King Ahasuerus, so she hath she she hath done wrong. See, she she sinned against God Himself in doing the things that she did. Now, if you were to look at Ezekiel chapter thirty six, this, this is why it's 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 amazing how these things just kind of work together. But in Ezekiel thirty six, uh, this is where we find that God says here, say for example, for verse 19, and I scattered them among the heathen and they were dispersed throughout the countries according to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. And when they entered into the heathen, whether they went, they profaned my holy name. See, they, 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 they make God's name unholy because why? Because watch what he says here. They profane my holy name when they said to them, These are the people of the Lord, our Hashem, and are gone forth out of his land. But I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore they say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen, wherewith you went. I will sanctify that my my great name which was profaned among the heathen which you have profaned in the midst of them and the heathen shall know that I am uh, Yahweh saith the Lord God when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes for I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land God promises to restore them back now and bear with me though, but in the dispersion, in the beginning, when God's name is profaned, just like the princes are saying here to, to Ahasuerus the king, you know, what she's done, 
is cause contempt. It's called, in other words, it profanes the name of God throughout all the nation. And that's what Israel did. Because she didn't come out when she was supposed to and recognize her God. And Mimican answered and said before the king, verse 16 here, um, and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but to also the princes and, and to all the people and all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad. We, just, we were just reading this. Sorry about that. Likewise, verse 18, Likewise shall the ladies of, the, of Persia and Midia say this day unto all the king's princes, which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. We even, even the Christian people, you've got to recognize who your Lord is. And we're going to get into that from, from looking at some of these here. Um, when, okay, so let's, let's continue on here. Verse 19. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persia, and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before the king Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. And this is the reason, and there's more, there's more places in the Bible that speak of this, where it talks about the fall of Israel. And how that God would be known by a people that he did not know. That his name would be exalted by them. Uh, and we know that that is written in there for, the, for he turns to the Gentiles. Okay, just to give you a little background on that. I wish I had the verses for that right now, but I, I don't write before me. I didn't write those down. And when the king decreed which he shall make, shall be published throughout all the empire, for it, it is great. All the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to great and small. And say, in, this, in the saying, please the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Mimican. For he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province, according to the, to the writing thereof. And of course, we know this is when Vashti then. Now notice now, I don't know if you guys realize this, Vashti is never divorced. She only loses her status as the queen herself she's not divorced as some think in replacement theology israel is just put away and divorced of god we do have a place in scripture where he divorces her but then he turns right back around in the same chapter he says oh israel i'm married unto you so she's not divorced she's only she's uh separated from the presence of the king and that's what that is uh let's go into chapter two and these things when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus was appeased. He remembered Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. Now, this speaks of a future redemption for Israel as well. See, he doesn't say it yet, but it speaks of that future redemption because we notice it says, when, and when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti. So she does come back in his remembrance. He's not forgot her. He's not cast her away utterly, as some people would think. He still remembers her. But he knows, see, God's word cannot change. And that's what we find, even in, in the reading of the story here in Esther and King Ahasuerus, his words cannot be altered. Once they were written, that was final. That was it. So, but anyway, so we go on and we find out then. It says, then said the king's servants that the ministered unto him, let there be fair young virgins sought for the king. And so that's what they do. They begin to gather up virgins and stuff from around the land, from all the different provinces. And, and the king appointed of the officers of the provinces of the kingdom that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan, the palace, uh, to the house of the women, and to the custodian of, of, of Higi, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things uh, for purification be given them. And let the maiden which pleaseth the king be queen instead of Vashti. And the thing pleased the king, and he did so. Now, this is when, now when the gospel took and it changed hands. And, um, and we see that, that 
when Israel had sinned and crucified their Messiah, their husband, they crucified him. Now, many of them believed, but, but that was still few in number compared to the number of Jews in the land at that day. He turns to the Gentiles. Even Paul, in his own epistles, he stays trying to win as many Jews to Christ as he can, getting them to recognize who their husband was. In other words, God himself had come down in a human body, and their husband was here walking on earth, and they had not recognized who he was. But there was a remnant that did believe. And so they took upon Yeshua, recognizing that it was God himself in a human body, and their husband was here among them. Uh, but when he finally comes to a place that they no longer would believe, he knew that the judgment that Jesus had already declared would come upon them. You know, Jesus even prophesied this, which we'll get into in just a, just a few moments here. But, uh, so he takes and he gathers the virgins. Now, what's interesting on that, if you go to, I believe it's in Luke, or maybe it's Matthew, uh, chapter 25. Uh, let me see if I can find that real quick here. Um, let me try Matthew 25 first. It speaks about the ten virgins. And that's something else that I find very ironic in this, because in the story of Esther, it's, it's, it's showing everything to you. Um, it's right after, oh wow, this is fascinating here. Um, Jesus also, well in chapter 25, he prophesies of the uh, of there not being one stone left upon another. And this is when he's going to prophesy of Israel uh, in their fall. Um, but the ten virgins, let's see, when you therefore shall see the abomination, oh gosh. Uh, maybe it's further back. I forget exactly where, oh here we go. And uh, oh, I was looking in the wrong chapter, I was looking at chapter 24. Chapter 25, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which, which took uh, their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamp and took no oil with them, but the, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now, you keep in mind, of course, with God, just like with King Ahasuerus here, he has more than one wife, but when he actually chooses one particular to be the queen, that's the representation of the five wise virgins that have the oil in their lamp. Uh, it, it is a representation of the bride herself, is what this speaks of. Uh, so I find it interesting that he gathers up all these virgins. In other words, this are the, this are the, 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 not only the Jews that were believing, but it was also speaking of the Gentiles that came in and, and that believed Jesus Christ to be Mashiach. They believed him to be the Messiah. And they, became, they were virgins coming in down through the ages, virgins coming in. But the thing is, is even though they're all virgins, and they all are willing to come before the king, he's only going to choose one to be his bride, to be the queen, in other words. And that is fascinating. And it thundered outside. I don't know if the video caught that. That was interesting. Now in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of uh, Jer, the son of Shammai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. I wonder how many of you guys catch that one right there. He's a Benjamite. Uh, remember when I spoke to you a little while back and everything about Joseph, the story of Joseph being a type of, of Yeshua, but yet Joseph, uh, when he was uh, condemned of his brother and thrown in the pit, they hated him because the, he was a spiritual boy and he had visions and dreams and, and all these things that would happen, so they figured they'd get rid of him. Same thing with Yeshua. But he goes down into Egypt. Even Yeshua went down into Egypt. That's kind of ironic. Of course, a lot of people know that. Um, but the thing that I always found fascinating when right before Joseph reveals himself to his brethren, now, they all are pardoned for what they did to him. Just like Yeshua on the cross, he pardoned them. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They were all pardoned. But before he reveals himself to him, or to them, when they're headed back and he finally gets to see Benjamin, which Mordecai represents Benjamin, the Jews of the day we're living in now, 
he puts his cup into his bag, has his servant chase him down, overtake him, and said, why did you do such evil unto them, to your master? And he said, you've stolen his cup. And of course, they all begin to weep and mourn, thinking, you know, what are you talking about? What do we do? And he started with the eldest until he got to the youngest, the servant did. He, he knew who every one of them were. He knew all about them. Don't think that Yeshua doesn't know all about you, my brothers. He does. And he got to Benjamin, and when he opened it up, the cup was in his bag. That was a sign to our people, brothers, that Benjamin, the one brother that was not guilty of anything when it came to Joseph, he's found holding the cup which represented none other than the last communion that Jesus had, Yeshua, on earth. And he was rejected by a Jew. He, uh, uh, Judas Iscariot, he was rejected by a Jew that sold him out. But yet, we weren't there. My family, my father's, my mother's side, my father's side, none of them were there. They weren't a part of the crucifixion of Yeshua. But we're found holding that cup in our hand. We are the Benjamites of today. That's the typology, I guess you would call in that there. We, we are Benjamin, the, the innocent one to his death, but yet we're found with the cup in our bag. And we have to make the decision what will we do with this cup? So anyway, so Mordecai is a Benjamin, and so he represents the Jews that are today and the Jews around the world. He is a representation for them. Uh, so he said he'd been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with uh, uh, Jeconiah, the king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, carried away. And he brought up uh, Hadass, Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. For she had neither father nor mother. Uh, the maiden, uh, excuse me, the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father had, uh, excuse me, when, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So God bless him for what he did there. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan, the palace, the custody of uh, Haggai, uh, Esther, was brought also into the king's house and to the custody of, of Haggai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him. She obtained kindness of him and speedily gave her things for purification. Now, this is... The Holy Spirit. Um, and, and there again, it's a type of that. But don't look at it as a separate being just because it's not the king. It's that anointing. See, God can take his own spirit and, and, and break it up and pour, pour it over each and every one of us. The Ruach HaKadosh can live and eat inside of each one of us. And it's, and it's there it's when you find favor with God, He allows His Spirit to come upon you. For what? Pleased Him, and, and she obtained kindness of Him, and He speedily gave her such things for purification with such things as belonged to her. That's fascinating. These gifts belong to you as the bride of Yeshua. They're given unto you for the purpose, for purification, for sanctification, for getting you ready to go in the presence of your God. Which, which such things as belongs to her, and seven maidens which were meet to be given her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. See, the bride, of, the bride of Yeshua finds favor in the presence of God. And he sends, just like Eliezer was sent down to get the beautiful Rebekah for Isaac. 
She found favor. He brought gifts. He's a type of the Holy Ghost. Eliezer was a type of the Holy Spirit going down, looking for the bride that her Lord would be pleased with. And when he found her, she found favor in his sight. Rebecca did. And he gave gifts. And I, I, I can't say for sure, but when I saw the seven maidens with her, I wondered... And, and this is just speculation on my part, but uh, I've mentioned to you before the seven um, church ages that are written, or the churches that are written in um, in Revelation, which even as Chuck Missler points out, harmonically speaking, they speak of the church down through the ages. Could that be the re the redeemed uh, uh, saints of God from the early ages, from Paul's age, being raised up? with her to go up as part of that bride. Now, that's, I don't know. Just a, an interesting thought when I saw that. I uh, can't say that that's right or not. It's just a, a, just a little thought there. Uh, but anyway, Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. That's another interesting thing. She didn't reveal who she really was. And believe me, there are Jews that are part of that bride even today. So... And uh, Mordecai walked every day before the court uh, 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 of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. Don't think that the Jewish people are not watching the Christians. They're curious to see if this rapture is really going to happen or not. Now when every man's maid turn was come to go into the king of Hussaris, after that she had been twelve months according to the manner of the women, for so was the days of their purification accomplished, to wit six months with oil and myrrh, and six months with sweet odors and the other things for their purifying of the women. Then thus came every maiden unto the king, whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. And the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women to the custody of uh, Shaashgaz, uh, Sha the king's chamberlain, which, which kept the concubines. She, the king, to, no more, except the king delighteth in her, and that she were called by name. You want to be called by name, I guarantee you that. And the thing is, is what do you take? What do you take with you when you go into the presence of the king. You better take oil. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Take the oil and be pleasing unto him. So, okay, so we kind of, let me kind of take you down a little faster. Let's go into verse 15. Now, when the turn of Esther, the daughter of, of, uh, of Ahiel, um, boy, I hate these names in this Bible here, the way they got them written. Avahail is probably what it actually is. It'd be something like my father. My father is is God. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't. Not sure. I'm not looking at it in Hebrew. So forgive me if I made a mistake there. I'm not sure there. Um, for his daughter was to come to go into the king. She required nothing but what uh, um, he got. You know, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed, and Esther obtained favor in the sight of all of them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken unto the king Ahasuerus unto this house, royal in the tenth month, which is in the month of Tibeth, the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, though, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Do we not have a rapture in this case here? It begins to appear to be so. Uh, now, keep in mind, don't take everything literal. Don't take everything chronological when I say this. Just kind of, let's just kind of follow this. Uh, and also keep in mind too, as we're looking at this, uh, it says, and the king loved her above all the women and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. There's your ten virgins again. That's the, what Jesus spoke of. Five were wise, five were foolish. You know, beautiful, beautiful type here. Not everybody that is a Christian is going to be the bride. 
And that's something that we learn in the story of Esther. Not everyone is to be the bride. And what you're going to really find out, though, is what the bride does, how she conducts herself and how she acts, what she should be doing. Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and his servants, and even Esther's feast. And he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat at the king's gate. Mm. The second time the virgins are gathered. First time was when Vashti was anointed king. The second time is the bride of Christ to be anointed, to be queen. Excuse me, I called Vashti king. Didn't mean that. Lord, forgive me. <laughs> She's queen. The second time they were gathered. But when the second time comes, where's Mordecai, the Benjamite? Where, where are the Jews at? They're at the gate. They're in their homeland. You, you know, I think of my brother Rob Skiba and I haven't listened to everything, so I, I don't pass judgment on my brother. I really want to talk to this brother. I really do. There are so many things that show that Israel is to be in her homeland to receive their Moshiach. We can't look at the carnal side of the state of Israel and think that God has not brought them there. He brings the whole group there in order to get the Benjamites, to get the true believing, the remnant of Israel. Certainly you're going to have a, a mixed multitude. It was a mixed multitude when Moshe brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. It's a mixed multitude when Yeshua come on the earth. It's a mixed multitude when Israel came back to her homeland. You know, what percentage is religious over there? And then you look at them and you say, well, they hate, the, they hate the Christian, they hate the Christian, they hate the Christian. What do you expect from them? They've had nothing but Christian people murder them for the last 2,000 years. And you think that the Jews are supposed to just all of a sudden up be all hunky-dory with, with Christians? They're not going to. Do you know God even, you're fixing to find out with Haman what God allowed to happen in order to bring about His Word. They're in their homeland though here. Again, not chronological order because it's kind of the story, even though the story's in a chronological order, it's not chronologically laid out in what happens to Israel though. Okay, so don't let that confuse you. Don't, when you're looking at the little types and little nuggets that God has hidden in His Word here, don't expect that... Well, oh, then, then it has, this next verse has to mean this or that. No, it's just little things that God points out to my heart for you to see. Mordecai said at the king's gate, and when the virgins were gathered together the second time, the first time was when he gathered them together for Queen Vashti, when Israel became the queen. The second time is when he brought out a Gentile bride that's mixed even with Jews. Esther had not yet shewed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther did the commandment of, the, of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. So beautiful. In those days while Mordecai sat at the gate, uh, the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bichthan and Teresh, of those which kept the door, were wroth and sought to lay hand on the king uh, Ahasuerus. And the thing was known to Mordecai who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when the inquisition was made of the, of the matter, it was found out, therefore they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Now that's interesting in itself. Now I can't say this is so, but when I read that, I could not help but think of Judas and the unrepented thief that was on the cross. Because the repentant thief went with Yeshua into paradise that day. But the unrepentant thief, he went to hell. And, the, and of course Judas, he hung himself on a tree as well. So not like the, uh, the butler and the baker in the story of Joseph in this case here. I think it speaks forward to those events there. Um, because they meant to do evil. And exactly. Um, no respect from the unrepentant thief. And Judas is a carrot. He just sought to see evil come to uh, Yeshua. 
After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of uh, Hamadatha, the Agite, that advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. Now, in this case here with Haman, this is where we actually are going back in time. One is looking forward. Now this is going back in time because Satan himself was exalted by God to be the right, to be his chief angel at that time. And even to this day, he still can go in the presence of God and is the accuser of the brethren. So that, that in itself is very interesting to me. Um, but anyway, let's see here. So he says, uh, he exalts him, and all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had no commandment concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Wow. What I'm going to say in regards to this is very difficult for you to understand, especially those of you that believe that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three different persons. They're three different gods. Now, when I think of the Trinity doctrine, I'm not against the Trinity doctrine when, the, when those people that believe this doctrine believe that there is one God, God Almighty, Hashem Himself, Yahweh, manifest Himself in the Son. He came down, He lived in Yeshua. He, he is the one that pours his own spirit out upon the people. It's his life, his spirit. As I talked to you about the Eitz Chaim in the Garden of Eden, the Tree of Life. And he breathed in the nostrils of Adam, uh, Nefesh Chaim, the breath of life, more than one life. He parted his own spirit. Chaim is, is Yahweh's life. See? Nishmat. Nishmat Chaim, he breathes that breath of life into, into this one person, because why? Adam and Eve are both in him. That's God's own spirit, it's him himself putting himself in there. Not that it's some other person, it's just one God. So what I want to show you here, remember what Satan said, he said, I want to be like God. I'll exalt myself up into the north, and I'll be like the Most High, and I'll be worshipped like him. Satan had to create a doctrine in this day and age, and even before this day and age, that made it as if there's more than one God. If he didn't make a doctrine such as this, or pervert God's plan where God manifests himself, even the Jews know, for example, Elohim being a plural form for the word God, the yod Mem in that, the, makes the pluralization there, doesn't mean multiple gods. Would make sense. Why does God say in Deuteronomy 9, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. It literally says, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Okay? Yahweh is just one God. But He manifests Himself in different ways. This is the Elohim. This is why we read earlier in Isaiah 63, the angel of His presence. The angel is the form in which God himself takes upon himself. But Satan wants to pervert that for you and make you think like, for example, when the three that came down to Abraham, that was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It was not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It was God himself with two angels. Could have been Michael and Gabriel for all we know. But the only God that was there was the one that stayed there with Abraham. That was Yahweh. And he was, what was it? That's the angel of his presence in this case. It's a human body in which God himself got into. That's what Yeshua is. But if Satan can get you to believe that there's more than one God, he can get worship to himself. If you really think that there's more than one God here, then you will worship the devil. And that's why he said, I'll sit in the temple of God being worshipped. The Bible says he sits in the temple of God. What is that? Uh, uh, Thessalonians, I believe it is sits in the temple of God, worshipped as if he were God, exalting himself all above that is called God. Haman is only a type of that. Watch what he says here. Uh, Esther chapter 3, verse 2 here. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. 
the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai. And remember, when I say this about him, God only permitted Satan to do what he's doing. He permitted him to be the chief angel, but he fell. He's permitting him to do the evils that he will do to the Jews and what he has done to the Jews. He permitted it to bring them to a jealousy, to bring them to recognition of who he is. And let me tell you something here. This is what's funny. In fact, that's something, God, thank you, God, Lord, for, for reminding me of this here. Mordecai represents the Jews. He doesn't bow. He doesn't bow to Haman because why? He knows there's only one God. But unfortunately, in many Christian realms, you, you go out and bow to Haman. Just like the Pope of today. You know that he gets a ring, he gets the king's ring. See, it's all symbolic in there. The Pope's got his ring and all the dignitaries from around the world come over to the Pope and bow down and kiss his ring. You've made him a God. No wonder why the scripture said he sits in the temple of God, worshipped as if he were God. Exalting himself above all that is called God. And I know I paraphrase that and I, I may have got that little mixed up in, in, in the quoting of that. But you can look it up. You can find that. Then the king's servants which were with the king's gates said unto Mordecai, Why transgress thou the king's commandments? Constantly trying to get the Jews to accept something that's not true. Do you think a Jew is ever going to accept Haman to be God? Or to be in his place? Or to accept the Pope to be God? No. Not real Jews. And yet you're... Oh, gosh. I hope you get this. I, I'm really not pushing as hard as I should, but I hope you get it. Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, he hearkened not unto them that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. Praise God for that. I'm a Jew. I serve one God. I don't serve multiple gods. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had shewed him the people of Mordecai, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were, were throughout the whole kingdom, and Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. Mm. In the first month, that is in the month of Nisan, the twelfth year um, of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is the lot, before uh, Haman from day to day and from month to month, into the twelfth month, that is in the month of Adar. And Haman said unto the king, Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered abroad, dispersed among the people in the provinces of the kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all the people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it unto the king's treasury. Now let me tell you something. I don't know anybody that's had more gold and silver to be able to destroy Jews than the Vatican has. Turn the cheek and everything else. And I'm sure as the scripture makes it clear here, their money has actually helped do it. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamatha, the Agite, the Jew's enemy. And the Vatican has been one of the biggest enemies of Israel. And yet, Shimon Perez making a covenant with them to allow them to come into our land. It's ridiculous. And the king's scribes called the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and the governors that were everywhere in the province and to the province according to the writing thereof, and every people after their language in the name of the king Ahasuerus 
was it written and sealed with the king's ring. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in the one day, even unto the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is in the month of Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. The copy of the writing for the commandment given to the, into the province was published unto the people that they should be ready against that day. The post went out and being hastened by the king's commandment and the decree was given in Shushan, the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes, put on sackcloth with ashes, and went out in the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. That is one reason why we don't see the 144,000 going into the rapture. We find that according to the scripture, I believe it's in Zechariah, that they will mourn when they see him whom they pierced. That's why they're not part of that rapture. They'll be in sackcloth and ashes, mourning and wailing for what happened. But yet, Esther, the queen, the bride of Christ, she will be there. But he goes out weeping and, and, and crying out. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai, to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. As we get ready to close here, I want you to really pay attention now. This is what a true bride of Christ is. This is people, when I think, when I think about the actions of Esther here, it speaks of who the bride of Jesus Christ really is. There are many virgins there that, are, that, that, know, that don't lose their life. They're still going to be part of the king's estate. Many Christians will never lose their life. But the bride of Jesus Christ takes a different stance. She's trying to do something to comfort and to console the one that she loves, the one that cared for her, the one that was her father. How many times we see in Christianity you say that that's our roots. Israel is our roots. Judaism is our roots. It's your father. And although it's not your natural father, neither was Mordecai, Esther's natural father, but nonetheless, it's what you come from. It's the background you come from. And look at the love that she has. So he refused. So Hattak went forth to the Mordecai into the street in the city which was before the kings. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasury for the Jews to destroy them. Also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given to Shushan to destroy them, to shew it unto Esther and to declare it unto her and to go charge her. She should go unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. And again, Esther spake, You, do you realize what that's saying when Mordecai shows the letter? It was written by the Jews what would happen. What would happen to Israel in the day that we're coming upon now. And he takes and shows her by letters the decree that went forth. You're being shown as the bride of Christ what is going to happen to the Jews unless you as a bride acts and do something about it. Where is the Lord Cadoza Moore that stands and goes across the world with PG, uh, P, uh, proclaiming justice to the nations? I'm trying to do the letters. PJTN. A, a lady that without regard to whether or not the Jews recognize Christ or not, but she'll stand with them that there don't be another Holocaust again. Where are people like that? You claim to be the bride of Christ and then you turn around and spit on the Jews. Because they don't agree with your doctrine. Because they don't become part of what you think they should be. Shame on you. When Mordecai, when God himself, through his own servants, the Jews, the prophets, that wrote your Bible, handed you the letter to show you what's going to happen, and you do nothing about it. 
You should be on your own face in sackcloth and ashes. And in fact, that's what the bride of Christ will do. I'm going to stop here in just a moment, but you really need to see something here. And it's going to be right here in chapter 4. And then I'm going to stop there and then we'll pick up another video and go on from there. And again, Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come into the king into the inner court. It is not called. There is one law and it is to be is one law of his to put him to death except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter and may live I don't care who you think you are if you're not called to be his bride you're the only one that can intercede for Israel right now but I have not been called to come into the king's these 30 days and they told Mordecai Esther's word then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all of the Jews. For if thou altogether hold thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. Remember when Jesus cried out and said to them, if they hold their cry when they were all screaming and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, are the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. They said, tell them to be quiet. He said, if they held their peace, the rocks would immediately cry out. If you don't cry out, if you don't pray, and if you don't get serious with God for the salvation of Israel, he will arise it from another place and you won't be part of that bride. He said, why? God is going to deliver Israel with or without you. But the thing is, as we find out in the story, the bride will take her place. She will recognize who she really is. And large and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows or who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Did not Jesus, did not the word say he would provoke them to jealousy with the people that were not his own? This is what you are brought in to being the bride for. His elect is so precious to Him. And you play a part, a vital part in that. And you're to go before the King and to cry out for mercy for them. Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer, Go gather together all of the Jews that are, are present in Shushan and fast, for, fast ye for me. And neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And also, and so will I go in unto the king, which is, is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. The hour that's coming on this earth, you have no idea. The time, the rapture itself. But before that rapture takes place, there's got to be a bitter cry. There's got to be some fasting and praying. There's going to be some Jews that are going to recognize in advance who Esther really is. They're going to recognize by your works to them that you were called for the very purpose that you're called for. And their life is laying in the balance of what you would do. Will you stand with her? Or will you turn your back? But like Mordecai said, for this reason, you were brought to this position.
And if you don't take your place, he'll find another way to save his elect because he's going to save them. My friends, I pray that you take it serious. I'd love to spend all my time trying to talk to you about these things, but I have to do regular work as well. I love you with, with a sincere love with all my heart. When I got a call the other day, last week, from this sister that's from Israel, and her excitement and enthusiasm for Yeshua, for seeing the things of God. She's one of the children of Mordecai that recognize who she is and is willing to give of her time to help translate what we do. And I'm just, I'm nobody special, just another pebble on the beach. But I'm trying to get you to wake up to know who you are. Are you an Esther? Or are you just one of the other virgins? You can be one of the other virgins in the palace and, and just take it carefree and think nothing of it. That's all right. You won't be lost because of that. But if you're the true bride of Christ, you'll cry out for the Jewish people. You're not going to be condemning them. You'll do everything you can. Even for those Jews that don't know who you are. Take a stand. Take it today. God bless you.